Hi, I'm Josh Greenwald, and uh, I'm going to talk to you guys about combat medics. This is, this is what you would see if you uh, were on a landing craft on D-Day. Um, machine guns were just ripping over the entire water. It was hailing um, machine gun shells. Um, so Staff Sergeant Ray Lambert, a combat medic, was 24 years old and assigned to command a team of medics on D-Day landing, June 6, 1944. He's 75 years old now. He's alive, 2019. It's okay. <laughs> um, he recounted his story to NPR. I don't know if you guys have heard of him, Ray Lambert. And just to totally chop it off, this is Emotep. He's the first physician uh, known to reject magic and look to science to heal. So, uh, <laughs> science, exactly. Uh, very advanced stuff. So this was 2600 BC. He was the, uh, he was basically the physician for King Djoser. And that is that Imhotep, that actor up there. You know, remember the, uh, the mummy? He was the bad guy. So he's kind of easy to remember because he's horrifying. Um, but that's Emotep, and he's actually a brilliant a surgeon. He's a writer. He uh, wrote uh, papyri, many papyruses on, um, yeah, I guess it'd be papyri, right? Uh, <laughs> he wrote many papyruses uh, on, on combat medicine, on how to do uh, anti-infectives, antibiotics, uh, how to do splinting, all that kind of stuff. These are the texts that he, he wrote. Uh, these are, were found in the 1800s in Egypt, and uh, they basically talk about using honey, which we've talked about uh, historically, if you guys remember. Uh, I talked about honey. Um, they had opium. They had jimson weed, which is like scopalamine. So they had medicines. They had actual medicines in, in ancient Egypt including this honey here, which is, this is modern version of the honey, that the same honey that they were using on their bandages, 2600 BC. Um, honey was an integral part of the three healing gestures, which is, uh, for the Egyptians, was washing the wound, applying a plaster. Uh, the plaster would be made from honey, animal fat, and vegetable fiber. So if you think about it, cotton, honey, and some grease, like Vaseline. Um, bandaging the wound, and, and none of this is different than what we have today. This is the, the standard. You, you want to stop the bleeding. You want to get them stabilized to where movement isn't going to make it worse, and then you get them to a, a surgeon as soon as possible. So this is Normandy, uh, Geneva Convention of 1864. Uh, it became illegal to shoot a person that had a red cross on. Like, that's a, that's a war crime. It's considered a war crime. Uh, so people wearing red crosses, aren't, they're not allowed to be offensive either. So uh, the medics are playing a game, and the soldiers are playing a game, and the soldiers are trying to take as many lives as possible, and the medics are trying to save all those lives. So it gets really complicated. <laughs> so uh, they, and they're basically like, notice all these guys, they're unarmed. <laughs> Most of them were carried like a sidearm, like they'd carry a 45 to protect themselves at the time, from uh, protect them and their patients. But people are already stabbing the medic or shooting the medic. Okay, so Ray, uh, as soon as the the door comes down on on uh, D Day, Ray gets shot through the right arm, just as the ramp drops. He he manages to patch himself up splint it, bandage it, and then start helping people that are getting shot as well as the, the bullets are hailing down. So he passed himself up. He went on to save the wounded. The ramp on a landing craft, he was trying to pull people out of the water. The ramp of another landing craft squishes him and the soldier into the water, into the sand, and they're drowning. So they, uh, the, the, the boat actually backs up, which is amazing. <laughs> they're like... Uh, I can't believe they backed up. Uh, so they, they backed up, saved him from drowning. Um, during that war, during that D-Day invasion, 10,000 Allied forces were lost, uh, wounded or counted missing that day, 6,600 Americans, and unknown number of combat medics. 
these are the, <laughs> back to Egypt, these, these are their tools. They actually have advanced surgical tools and in steel and in glass and in um, uh, flint, which can go down to the sharpness of a razor. Compared that to, uh, they even had stethoscopes. So the Egyptians had battle aid stations, they had surgeons, they had people that stabilized people on the field and then brought them off the field again. So the same thing happened in civil war. You have, you have basically like medical tents and then people on wagons sort of pulling the wounded around. Um, and then most of it was for amputation. All of this was for amputation. Um, on the good news is they had anesthesia. They actually had chloroform and like ether. Um, so they had actual meds to knock you out while they were sawing off the limbs. And they said it was like 90% of the time they used anesthesia and 75% of the people that got anesthesia like, were, were, were basically more likely to live if they had their leg sawed off. So now we're in the Middle Ages. I love this photo or this, this picture, this drawing. Uh, so in the Middle Ages, most of the medical aid was provided by the church and clergy. So like nurses, nuns, uh, they got carried off to hospitals. Now knights, if you notice on the, on the ground there, there's a whole bunch of knights, and one of them's biting that girl's ankle for some reason. <laughs> but in the knights, uh, their squires knew first aid. And back when the knight was a squire, would have learned first aid. So they did their own first aid, as far as knights were concerned. Uh, then they actually uh, historically hired surgeons for wars. So they were like, we want to do this big invasion, we need like three surgeons. So they would just hire three local surgeons and, and just start working on the side of the field. Okay, Ambrose Paré. He tied ligatures around arteries and uh, instead of using boiling oil, Yes, they used boiling oil. I thought that was like the horrible most thing. Like, you've already got this big gash wound or a bullet wound, and then they're going to pour boiling oil through it. And that's just terrible. So <laughs> he, he decided and said he ran out of boiling oil. And he's like, you know what? I'm just going to clamp off all these arteries. So that's what he's doing. He's, he's tying them off with ligatures. He's tying little uh, like surgical thread around arteries. Uh, and this was a huge thing at the time. And then Paré, in the 1500s here, he was um, considered one of the fathers of surgery and modern forensics uh, pathology, like why did this guy die, how did he die? Um, surgical techniques in battlefield medicine, because basically they were doing autopsies. They were doing a lot of autopsies. And he was in the Parisian Barber Surgeon Guild, which the whole time when someone mentions barber in front of surgeon, I immediately like think less of them. I'm sorry, but if you could get a haircut by the same guy that's sewing your leg up, you're, you're in a bad shit position. These are all the wounds. All of them. <laughs> so you get all of the wounds. Caravaggio was here. Caravaggio, yeah. And then I stabbed him in his thigh. Okay, and then I'm pretty sure those are buboes. Those are uh, the plague is what's going on in his groinal area. Um, so yeah, these are all the, this is 1500s and it's German and they wanted to basically show you all of the wounds in horrible graphic detail. 1500s German. Yeah. Okay. So this is a, this is a MASH hospital. Who remembers MASH? <laughs> Yay. Hawkeye. Yeah. Uh, very realistic actually. Like when you research this, the, when you research MASH, uh, when I was researching like, um, Korean, the Korean War, very accurate about what, what was going on. I watched all of MASH as a kid, and, and I even, we even had like the MASH trivia game. <laughs> uh, so anyway, these are the field hospitals. Notice all the crosses. That means you can't bomb them. Don't bomb them, please. And, th and if you think about it, like this is the cross. And the Geneva Convention made it so that you you're not supposed to be able to, to wound one of these people because they're not worried about, they're not being offensive people, they're, they're basically being medics or doctors or whatever. So they wear the Red Cross. The Red Cross protects them, but also opens them up for snipers. 
So in Korea on, and it happened in World War II a bit too, but in Korea and in, um, in Vietnam, lots of snipers, lots of sniper action. So they're like, we have to get rid of these, these crosses immediately. So they still put crosses on, on everything, but if you're going out in the field, they, they, take your, uh, they tell you to take all your crosses off and to uh, blacken all of your badges. So these are, these are the blackened badges that actually I wore when I was in the Navy as a combat medic. You can't see that top right, left one either, right? It's too dark. That's, a, that's how they like it. It's a big dark cross. Uh, it's a big dark um, um, caduceus. It's like the bottom one. And then those, that's my rank when I was in the, in the Navy, those E5. Upper right is, is combat medic, um, army. So that's army combat medic. Notice there's a little stretcher. We don't really use, I mean, we use stretchers on the ship, but not really. <laughs> not, like, not like flat. Um, yeah, ship, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Okay, so this is, all of, um, this is all of the deaths of the Navy enlisted medical workers during each war. So notice that there's not a lot, and then suddenly, World War II, there's 1170. That's a lot. That's because of that Red Cross. That's because of snipers. So in the Korean War, there was only 109. Vietnam, there were 639, which is another really high number. So they were basically wounding. These are the Navy medics that were killed. So there was tons of wounding of the medic because then it take five, four people to take care of the wounded medic. So the sniper would literally shoot the lieutenant shoot the radio operator, wound the medic. That way the rest of the squad will try to keep the medic alive because the medic keeps them alive. So if you're a sniper, like that's a really great target. This was our bandaging. This is bandaging in World War II, or World War I, sorry. Um, there's a quote, the war was won with bandages and scissors. And these, see those safety pins up there? Those were sometimes used to close wounds in an emergency, which I found like totally, wow. That's very punk rock. <laughs> yeah, I closed it with safety pins. Um, so these kind of pouches, the, the actual soldiers would carry. So they would have one on themselves. And when we would be crawling around on the field to get to patient to patient, you'd find their medical kit tear their medical kit open and bandage them with their own stuff. That way you're not wasting your materials or carrying it. So on a ship, ships, um, they use something called a Stokes basket. Can you read that? Let me see. Yeah, that's legible. Okay, so basically it's like a basket, literally steel basket that you can put a little cover over. And if you remember on MASH, they were hanging off the side of the helicopters. Those are the same they used for passing patients between ships. So they would literally like have a, a, a line strung, like a zip line equivalent, and then they would run patients across between two ships that were riding like this. <laughs> so in World War I, it was so tight in the, in the trenches that they had to put hinges in the middle of their, their stretchers. So this is pretty cool, I thought. So the, the guy hangs below. You got the two shoulder pads areas at the ends. So th those go on the shoulders of the, the, the people carrying the, the stretcher bearers. And then the patient goes in the middle, and that little arm there, uh, that little rod, you can bend and like wiggle the patient through the tight trenches. So it was that frickin' tight, which is crazy to me. Speaking of tight, this is crammed in to eight high, well, eight total onto this little horse cart. This is World War I again. Uh, this is on the way to a MASH hospital. Eight-man ambulance drawn by horse, I think, and, and jeep. Ships. Okay, this is the mercy and the repose. These are hospital ships. This is where, when that door went, came down, and our buddy was shot in the arm, he gets squished, they pick him up and they put him on the carrier, the, the, the landing craft again, with, with like a couple of medics. They pull him out and they, they drop him off at one of these. 
So this is the mercy and the repose. These are still in, in effect. These are still, uh, repose got uh, decommissioned, but the mercy is still around, and it's the mercy and the comfort are the current two, but they're exactly the same, so I figured I'd show you the repose to see what the old ships looked like. Um, but these are entirely hospitals, like besides what runs the ship, and you know, everyone, you know, there's like, medical is like the whole ship. Um, I was on an aircraft carrier. G.I. Joe. Okay, even G.I. Joe has medics. They have two of them, and I've never saw them in the show. Did anybody ever see a medic? Did anybody ever see anybody get actually hurt on G.I. Joe? I'm pretty sure they shot the plane down, parachuted down to the ground with each other, and then punched each other in the face. That's how G.I. Joe went. Spoilers, sorry, that's like every episode. <laughs> so there's two of them, and they're named Doc. Uh, and that's actually what you call a corpsman or a medic in the, in the field is Doc. These would be our modern medics. Notice the uniforms. Like, you can't tell the difference between one and the other, right? And that's the point. They actually, all the blackened, everything can't tell is uh, you literally, I can't tell another medical officer or whatever, or I can't tell a medical person unless they get like five feet away. And then you're like, oh, hey. But everything's, everything's like camoed now. Everything's super camoed. Uh, this here medic is modern, and he's carrying an, um, that's a new, the new sled stretchers, which I thought were pretty cool for like sand and snow and things like that. Um, in the, this guy's still getting shot at. Not, <laughs> not currently, but he will be. So, spoilers again. But he can carry uh, an M4 assault rifle if he wants. I got offered, like, hey, do you want the pistol or the rifle? And if you take the pistol, you're still covered under the Geneva Convention. If you take the rifle, you're not. You can, le you can literally legally be shot at that point by the enemy because they like, I didn't know he was a medic, he was carrying a rifle. So it's literally, they also shoot the guy with the, the 45 because they figure he's an officer or he's a medic. So. This is a good book, uh, Sumer, going from Sumer all the way to the fall of Constantinople. Um, and this is to the brave and fearless combat medics through history. Thank you. <laughs>